Okay, um, uh, welcome everyone. I uh, hope everyone can uh, hear me. Um, yeah, my name is Venkat Guruswami and I'm a senior scientist uh, here at the Simons Institute. And uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Institute and uh, in particular to this week's workshop. And I guess it doesn't need much introduction, but the Simons Institute is the leading international venue for collaborative research in theory of computing and related fields. It was established in 2012 by a generous uh, grant from the Simons Foundation who continue to support us uh, very generously. And every semester the Institute brings, uh, brings together world's leading um, researchers in various fields related to theory, as well as the next generation of uh, outstanding young scholars. And this is the 10th year of uh, programs uh, at Simons. And these programs have together really pushed the frontiers of TCS in so many directions. They made progress on long-standing challenges of the field, and also op opened up uh, new directions of inquiry. And I think this week's workshop is an illustration of the latter theme. And on top of uh, these thematic semester programs, uh, which run through the semester, the Institute also hosts various outreach activities to enhance and broaden the appreciation of an understanding of TCS. And it also hosts workshops on timely topics of significant importance and promise. And again, this week's workshop fits that theme perfectly. And so this week, we are pleased to host uh, one such workshop on multi-group fairness and the validity of statistical judgment. And I would like to take a moment to thank the organizers of the workshop for their work uh, in putting together a great uh, program. So they are uh, Alexandra, uh, Nika, uh, Moritz, Michael, and Omer. And I think most, if not all of them are here ready. So thank you. And, uh, Omer take over shortly to give uh, more details about the workshop itself. But before I hand it over to him, just a few logistics for the coming week. So food is provided before the first talk and in the breaks just outside where you are now. And for lunch, you're on your own, but there are many options uh, in nearby walking distance. And we ask that you please uh, leave any food and drinks, including coffee uh, outside the auditorium, helps us uh, keep the space clean. And if you need to store your things during the day, there are lockers on the back end of the building. Um, you can uh, use that and they're very easy to use. And uh, our uh, videographer, Omiyad, will be here throughout to help speakers get set up if there are any issues. And I believe there is also a Zoom link for this workshop and um, it's hybrid. So for people in the room, raise your hand to ask questions. Others, I guess, hopefully the session chairs are monitoring and- We will find it. Yeah, will yeah, they will be monitoring and fielding questions. And I finally, a special thanks to our ev events team, Ashley Hassan and Elizabeth Ewan for managing all the logistics for this week's event. It takes a lot of effort to put uh, together an event and particularly events which are not part of the semester, the one-off events like this. So a uh, big thanks to them. So and, uh, and with that, I'll hand it over. Thank you. Welcome everybody. I know that uh, organizers should only thank at the end because you need to think based on the actual uh, <laughs> to see if it was worth it, uh, but hopefully it will. Uh, there are two Simon, the Simon Foundation is involved in this in two ways. First, uh, through our uh, gracious and wonderful host, the, uh, the Simons Institute, and also through the um, Simons collaboration on the theory of algorithmic fairness, which is organizing and uh, uh, the event and uh, which uh, supported a lot of the research we're going to talk about. And in four sentences, I think we'll see, uh, the premise of this uh, workshop is the following. About five years ago, uh, notions of multi-group fairness have been introduced uh, in the context of uh, algorithmic fairness and uh, various, the continuous uh, struggle to, to understand notions of fairness. We want, we'll talk a little bit about fairness, but we'll talk about other connections mostly this week. Um, because at the beginning, we already knew some connections uh, through algorithms that we adopted from machine learning, uh, statistics, game theory that were very useful and made these notions achievable. But over the last five years, there's been a growing understanding of a lot of connections, um, both to all of these areas and to indistinguishability, complexity theory. And we'll talk a lot about these connections and uh, our, the growing understanding that we have, hopefully first to get all of us into the same position and perhaps to foster a new research and to focus new research 
on uh, whatever challenges we find are exciting. Um, in terms of the organization of the week, today will be kind of um, like a mini boot camp. Um, and then uh, Tuesday and Wednesday will be we'll talk about uh, learning statistics. Thursday we'll have a lot of uh, complexity theory, indistinguishability, and Friday we'll look uh, beyond. But of course, there are other uh, reasons for putting talks in different times, so it won't completely uh, follow this. But this is the general rule. And with that, I want to introduce uh, uh, Michael, who is going to uh, take over and talk about multi-calibration, outcome indistinguishability in the next uh, two slots. Thank you. All right. Um, can everyone hear me? I'll project more. When... Great. Um, so uh, as Omer said, I'm going to speak about this I two ideas, uh, multi-calibration and outcome indistinguishability. Um, really sort of there are two parts of this talk. I planned one really long talk, so we'll break whenever it feels natural um, or when the time is up. Um, and so, yeah, for today, I'm going to start with overviewing uh, multi-calibration as a notion of algorithmic fairness and really try to dive into some of the technical details that I don't often talk about in sort of uh, slide talks. Okay, so I'm going to go through proofs. I'm going to go through sort of technical details um, so that hopefully uh, we're all on the same page. Um, and then in the second half, I'll talk about this idea of outcome indistinguishability and how it's related to multi calibration, how it's related to some other notions. Really, the idea is to set up uh, the rest of the workshop um, where a lot of, I think, a lot of the talks, not all of the talks, but a lot of the talks um, down the road are going to be using these ideas. So um, please, if things are unclear, uh, especially at a technical level, pause me and interrupt me and uh, ask questions. I'd rather get through 70% you know, that I need to get through and have everybody understand it than get through everything and have nobody understand. Okay? Okay, good. So uh, I think most of us are probably on the same page about this if you're at this workshop. But uh, to begin, uh, I want to motivate that algorithms are everywhere we look these days. Um, and more and more, uh, they're increasingly implicated in making consequential predictions about people. Okay, ML algorithms are driving our cars, they're running advertising uh, marketplaces, even making medical predictions, right? And I like all of these examples because they're situations where historically human decision makers have been highly regulated to ensure for some kind of responsibility or fairness, right? Um, if you want to drive a car or you want to practice medicine, you need to go get a license. And uh, federal laws protect individuals from discrimination in advertising, okay? Um, so as we move more and more of our decision-making capacity from human decision-makers to computational decision-makers, to algorithms and machine learning, we need to start to reason about what it means for these algorithms to be fair, what it means for them to be responsible and try to come up with uh, satisfactory answers to this question, okay? So uh, rather than trying to address questions of fairness on an algorithm by algorithm and situation by situation basis, the program that we're talking about today really uh, tries to take a more foundational approach. Stepping back and, and, and formalize, identifying general concerns, general patterns of concern, like fairness in prediction systems, and then formalizing these concerns into concrete definitions in the language of computer science, math, and statistics, right? And, and really the, the hope is that these definitions will clarify what we can and cannot achieve uh, using ML prediction systems. Um, and a huge emphasis will be on making sure that we get the definitions right, right? So in this, in this line of work, we're really inspired by the success stories of cryptography where subtle human notions like secrecy and privacy have been formulated into uh, concrete mathematical de definitions 
that not only come with uh, a beautiful theory, but also underlie the, the technical tools in your browsers today. Okay, so, so that's sort of the, the backdrop. Um, as I said, I'm gonna be introducing some concepts uh, and sort of they'll lay out the overview for today's talk. Um, we'll start with multi-calibration as a notion of fairness and prediction that gives a, a new computational perspective. Um, can, I, can I already stop yeah, you? Sure. So when you say you get inspired by the theory, mm -hmm. and is it fairness that it holds to bring into such a definition? That's a, it's a great question. Like, it is past done, be done for fairness, but you're after something. Yeah, so, so um, I think the truth is that when we, when we talk about fairness, we're going to, I'm probably this is the last time I'm gonna say fairness uh, in the talk. I'm gonna give you a concrete definition. I'm gonna talk about a specific concern of uh, a type of unfairness you might anticipate um, and how that arises due to miscalibration. And then we'll talk about multi-calibration as a solution concept for um, to address that concern. Um, as we'll see, I think throughout the rest of the talk or throughout the rest of the workshop, there are other fairness concerns that you might address using the same tools. But but really, sort of the I'm going to remove these quotation marks pretty soon. Great question. Good. So so we'll talk about multi-calibration and then outcome distinguishability. Okay, and so for multi-calibration, I want to give you sort of a, a high level idea of where we're going. I'm going to start with preliminaries and motivation and sort of technical um, background. Um, then I'm going to give you the definitions and we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about these definitions and really uh, digging into them. Um, and then finally, uh, in the multi-calibration section, I'm going to talk about a, an algorithm for learning multi-calibrated predictors. Okay, this is sort of the, the the goal. Good. So, um, good. So, while the concern for fairness in systems out there these days is very widespread, for today's talk, I want to focus on algorithms that make predictions about people. Okay. So, a good example to have in the back of your mind, I think, is that of medical risk prediction. Okay. Where we're trying to develop a predictor, an algorithm that takes in an individual patient's data, right? Somebody comes to the clinic, you put in their data, you run it through this algorithm, this predictor, and it's gonna spit out some predicted probability of a certain health outcome. Say the, the probability that they'll have a heart attack in the next five years. Right. Um, okay, and a, a bit more uh, formally, we're gonna think about uh, denoting individuals as X, um, these would, X could represent an individual patient's health records. We'll think about outcomes as Y. Um, for today's talk, uh, we'll think about Y as being binary, living in zero one, you could generalize this. But again, it's an indicator of whether they had a heart attack or not. Um, good. And so then the, the name of the game in supervised learning is given a bunch of individual outcome pairs, right? Given this training data, from historical examples, train or find, learn a predictor P that maps in new individuals X into the range zero one that will represent some sort of probability of the health outcome for that individual. Great. Okay, hopefully no questions yet. Uh, even more formally, um, we're gonna think, we're gonna work in this, what some called, sometimes called the agnostic path model. Okay, where we're given a, where we're given sample access to a fixed unknown distribution that will denote D star on X Y pairs. Um, importantly, the agnostic here means that we're making no assumption about the the mapping from X's to Y's. Right, we're we're not going to assume that this comes from some simple class. It could be arbitrarily complex. Okay, and in particular. Our goal will be to learn some estimate of individual probabilities, to learn a predictor that given an X spits out a probability. Um, the target that we'll have in mind is this Bayes optimal predictor, okay? We'll denote this as P star. It represents the true probability of the outcome being one given X, given an individual X, okay? And, and again, 
because of this agnostic assumption, we're going to make no assumptions about the complexity of P star. P star could be uh, computationally intractable. It could be even statistically impossible to learn. Okay, and so so given that impossibility, given that hardness, we're going to think about what are meaningful solution concepts to recover meaningful uh, predictions of probabilities. Okay, that that's sort of the the technical setup. Any questions at this point? Um, feel free to interrupt me and jump back if things are still unclear in the in the future. Okay, so so let's let's jump into this idea of fairness. Okay, I lied. I'm, I'm going to use fairness uh, a few more times. But so we're going to talk about um, a, a concern of fairness due to uh, miscalibrated predictions. Okay, um, and so. Here, I'm going to start with a cartoon that's based on a real study, but it, 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 in this cartoon, um, I'm plotting the predicted probability versus the actual probability. Okay, so, so the, these curves here, rep, each point on the curve maybe represents an individual person where uh, they have an actual probability, and we're looking at what the algorithm spits out as their predicted probability. Okay. Um, and so the, the concern that we have here is that these predictions might be miscalibrated. Okay, uh, I'll get into the technical definition of calibration, but at a high level, miscalibrated predictions mean that, that across different groups, the same predicted probability means something different. Okay, so for instance, in this, pop, in this cartoon, we have an orange population and a blue population, and the, the predictions means something different in the different populations. Okay, what, what's the consequence of this miscalibration? The consequence is some sort of disparate impact where the, the quality of care and the, the, the nature of the predictions varies across these different groups, right? So if we set a fixed threshold on the predicted probability, in effect, we're setting two different group specific thresholds on the actual probability, okay? Um, and, and so far from hypothetical, this cartoon is based on an empirical study that looked at existing medical risk predictors that are out there being used in hospitals today um, that exhibit this kind of miscalibration, okay? And what's the consequence of that? The, what they argued is that in order to qualify for advanced care, okay, right? This, this uh, predictor maybe is used for triage, and so the, the result that was shown is that in order to qualify for advanced care, black patients had to be considerably sicker than their corresponding white patients. Right? So in this case, the black patients would correspond to the blue curve. Um, and so there, the actual threshold that needed to qualify for advanced care was much higher. It had to be much riskier. Okay. Is there we what a question about do you get access to the P stars? Okay, so the question was about whether we get access to P star, and the answer is no. We'll only assume P star is really in our heads. We'll imagine it as uh, there being some joint distribution on XY, but we only ever get access to XY pairs. Yes? Do we have any speculation about what led to the miscalibration in this case? Yeah, so, so they, they um, in this study, they speculate that actually it, one of the reasons was a faulty target or a faulty proxy. So what they, they indicted is that the algorithms were originally trained on predicting cost of care rather than on riskiness of the patient. So, so there, there's a number of different reasons why this kind of thing might occur. That was what they um, indicted. Yeah. Um, the follow-up asks, if you don't see P star, then how do you talk about this graph? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so again, this, this cartoon is very much a cartoon in our heads, um, right? We, it, it's actually pretty difficult to generate these actual probabilities. What does that mean? Um, the, you know, in this study they did, uh, they took some care to, to try their best to reconstruct these actual probabilities um, in that. But, uh, but the concern still stands even if even if these sort of lives in our heads. Is, is that though the right note? I mean, 
why wouldn't you be able to accept visa? Like, I mean, good. So in some cases, after the group indicator. Yeah. And enough historic data, then you should be able to get visa. That's right. So so for we'll probably be able to get a good estimate of the probability within a group, mm -hmm. but given you know your covariance. Exactly the covariance defining for Alka, uh, you know, your internet history, e everything, uh, all of the information that I could observe about you. I only ever get to see your outcome once. Um, it's unlikely that I'm going to see um, your, your covariance that many times that I could get an accurate estimate of the true probability. That's, that's the setting we're living in. Yeah. So how should I interpret the blue? It's if I understand correctly, you should interpret it as the actual probability given a specific uh, predictive probability, right? Not the actual probability of an individual. Uh, is that the correct interpretation, or am I missing how to do this blue line? Like, yeah, I, I understand I can measure it, but in my head, yeah. What is the blue line? Um, I'm I'm not sure. So is it? Should I? I mean, even every dot there yeah. is the actual probability of being one conditioned on having that predicted uh, probability on your model, or is it, should I interpret it as a scatter plot of the actual probability of giving one for a particular individual or for a particular very like the ladder, uh, like a scatter, scatter plot? Ladder. So in that case, why is it a function? Why is it on a line? Right? I mean, it, 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 that's what I'm trying, like it wouldn't be, you know. Oh, yeah. So I, I just did that to, um, I did that to disambiguate so that we're not talking about so that I can say that the it, it could it could not make it to be like a cloud, right? Yeah, cloud it could be a cloud. Yeah. It's a it's yeah. It's meant as a very gross cartoon. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. So let, let me push forward about sort of what, what we would assume that we know about these um, groups, about the individuals, and, and how we might uh, try to address this concern. Right. So, so um, I said that the concern was given by miscalibrated predictions. A natural uh, solution then should be to try to calibrate these predictions. Okay, and, and in particular, we're going to need to think about calibrating these predictions across the groups of interest. So I will assume that somehow these groups are encoded in the features that we have access to. Um, okay, so what 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 is calibration? Calibration um, is, is a technical notion that is defined by this conditional expectation. Okay, Matthew. That's the first one, not that of the going back to my question, right? Yeah. So the latter one is probability of a particular individual, but this is the first one, right? This is a probability condition of a particular value. So, so again, I'm confused about where the blue line is and whether this is supposed to capture the blue line. No, no. The the so the the orange curve and the blue curve are meant to represent different different populations. So that I understand. Okay. Okay, but what is the what's the x-axis on the on the map? Is the x-axis on the map should I put it as I'm going back to my question because it seems that yeah, the answer yeah. is different than what it says here. Should the x-axis be the probability of an individual, or should the x-axis be the p of x for an individual, or should the x-axis be p of x condition on a particular predictive value? But I mean those are, are two different things, right? Because I, I the x-axis is p star. It's the beta's optimal star. So that's not what's written in that uh, in that slide that you had there. Uh, this is this that's is a new the, definition. That's not the same thing, though. That's very, those things are very different, right? That's right. Yeah. So, but the x-axis you should think of not as what you have here. I, this is a new definition that it's I'm going to. It's not the x-axis. It's not the x-axis. X-axis is p star. I'm plotting p star versus p events. Yeah. Is that clear? Like, uh, it's a cartoon we're going to push forward, but um, but I hope it's clear that I'm plotting the Bayes optimal probabilities on, on the x-axis versus the output of our algorithm, whatever it is. For now, it's P of X. So, so if S, our groups here, S, corresponded to the orange population and the blue population, then these predictions would not satisfy this definition. They would not be calibrated. 
So calibration would um, sort of, uh, there, you know, there, there's a, a, a bunch of ways you could satisfy it, but, but at very least, it means that amongst the individuals who are getting the same predicted value, you can't have different actual average values. Yeah, I guess the point is that, like, so for the graph, for this graph, calibration is not satisfied, but if calibration is satisfied, it's not necessary that the two lines be together. That's correct. That's correct. So, good. good. Right. And so that's what we're going to go through now. So that the calibration is trying to get at some idea. It, it's 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 a good idea. It's it's a it's a maybe a, the first thing you would think of. Okay. So what what is this notion of calibration? Calibration says that predictions mean what they say. Okay. So that is when I look at the individuals for whom I give out uh, a, a value of v, a prediction of v to. Um, then the expectation in this group is actually roughly v. Okay. So that is uh, amongst the individuals where I say that um, there's a 20% chance of a heart attack, about 20% of them will actually have a heart attack. Um, questions that we need to ask now, though, are, are there's a few key questions. First, which groups should be, we be reasoning about? Right. So, so maybe. Uh, we did a very good job. We you know, observed these orange and blue population and recalibrated, come, came up with new predictors um, and tried to match them up. This would be sort of a, an ideal situation. But in doing so, maybe then we discover a, a new population that we hadn't considered. Okay? Um, then maybe we have to calibrate over that group. Um, and maybe uh, if we think about groups defined by intersections of attributes, um, you know, then, then it introduces even more groups, okay? How do we reason about calibration then? Um, and so the bigger issue though, for, for why, what the issue with calibration is, is that um, calibration allows a certain kind of uh, what I call algorithmic stereotyping, okay? It, it allows you to treat a group um, as a monolith and, and ignore variation within this group. Okay, in particular, um, so the result of this is that the quality of the predictions can vary significantly across significant groups, even under calibration. Okay, so maybe in this orange population, we're matching, we, you know, we, we get a pretty good slope one line. Um, but in this blue population, you see that we, we're giving out the same prediction in everyone. Um, how can that be the case if we're insisting on calibration? Well, I said that calibrations needs, uh, calibrated predictors need to mean what they say, but they don't need to say very much. Okay? In particular, it's possible to give out uh, a fixed value that is the mean of the distribution, the mean of the outcome, the expected outcome to everyone in the group and satisfy calibration, right? Because then this conditioning on my prediction doesn't do anything. It just says, look at everybody in that group. And, and indeed, then the expectation of the outcome is correct. Okay, so, so this is a serious issue. This is a much more serious issue than like um, whether, you know, we're lining up the curves uh, appropriately. Calibration on its own is very weak. It allows you to do things where you just completely overlook the, vari the true variation in P star in an entire group. Good. And so in particular, um, while these predictions might be uh, calibrated on uh, the blue group as a whole, they're certainly not calibrated on important subgroups within this group. Right? In particular, if we were able to identify these higher risk blue uh, patients, then it, it somehow witnesses the fact that, that on this subgroup, the predictions are no longer calibrated. Okay. And so, so ideally, ideally then, what we would push for is to be calibrated on every group. Right? If we were able to be calibrated on, over every different subgroup, then we would effectively have to be calibrated on individuals, which would mean that uh, we would basically learn P star. We would have to give out uh, uh, fixed 
sort of slope one line on this curve and, and using a fixed threshold on the predicted probability would really correspond to a fixed threshold on the actual problem. Okay. That would be uh, the ideal. The question is what is a meaningful notion of every group, right? Pretty quickly when we start to say things like this, it becomes very obvious that like statistically, this is not possible from a small sample of data. We just can't learn something that is calibrated over every group. We said that P star is likely inaccessible, so we can't hope to do this. But still, we're gonna try to push forward. And this is the motivation behind multi-calibration. Okay, so, so here's, here's the high level idea of multi-calibration. The guiding principle says that you want to protect not every group, but every identifiable group, okay? Um, th that is to say that we want to protect every group that we can hope to identify given the data and computational resources available to us. Um, and, and this notion really provides a qualitatively different notion than sort of standard group calibration, where we're forcing through this notion, we're forcing the predictor to learn within protected populations not just marginally over the population as a whole, okay? Um, the way we formalize this, and we're gonna spend you know, the next 10, 15 minutes going through this, is through a collection of subpopulations, okay? So at a high level, we say for a collection of subpopulations C, a predictor is C multi-calibrated if its predictions appear calibrated over every subgroup in this collection of subpopulations. Okay, um, and so really, ideally, the collection C should identify meaningful and important subgroups um, that may overlap with one another, may be defined through intersections of different features. Um, we want to think about this collection as being a very rich collection of subgroups. Um, and we'll go through sort of the extremes of that definition next. Yeah. Should I think of C as like fixed beforehand or something that's learned in the process? Yeah, so C will, throughout, we'll, we're going to think of C as being fixed. Um, concretely, you might, we'll see sort of concretely what you might think of fixing it to be. There's a few conditions. Okay, so, so let's just sort of map out where we are in terms of like, we wrote down a definition, calibration over every subgroup in some collection of subgroups. What, what does this give us uh, technically? Um, and the point is that the collection of subpopulations that we choose really uh, determines qualitatively like what, what the strength and efficiency of the guarantee will be. Okay, On sort of one extreme, if we, set, uh, if we take this collection to be, let's say, O of one protected groups, then we're gonna recover this notion of group calibration, right? Um, that this, um, this notion is efficient, we can efficiently calibrate, but as we saw, it provides very weak protections. There's ways to treat groups um, completely as a monolith, um, not capture any of the variation within the population, um, even though the, these groups are supposedly protected by calibration. Okay, so that's sort of at, at the one extreme um, of a group notion of fairness. On the other extreme, we can imagine sort of defining an individual notion of individual fairness or individual calibration. Um, this is sort of in the, a la um, fairness through awareness, but sort of at, at the extreme, you can imagine defining uh, a collection of subpopulations based on singletons. Right. Every single individual is a set, um, and I want to be calibrated on those individuals. Of course, this, this is a ridiculous notion to propose if you're hoping to learn this thing from data, but um, the point is that it recovers P star, and one can think about um, defining some metric version of this. Right. So, so um, if you're familiar with individual fairness. If you're not familiar with individual fairness, the point is that at the extreme, if we define C to be expressive enough, then we do have to recover the Bayes optimal probabilities, okay? So what that says is that at the extreme, it's a very powerful notion, albeit inefficient, okay? And so the real question that we're gonna ask here is whether there's something in between where we could hope to choose a set, a collection C, a set system C, that will give us a powerful guarantee 
but also allow us to get efficient solutions. Um, any questions at this point? Okay, I'm going to push forward then. Um, good. So, again, the the perspective is that we're we're going to try to um, protect every group that we can reason about. Okay, what 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 does that mean? Okay, I, I need to define some minimal conditions um, to even begin to talk about what it means. You know. We need some minimal conditions on what it means to, to even identify a group or even specify a group, okay? Or specify a collection of groups. Um, and I'm gonna be informal about these minimal conditions initially, but as we'll see, I, you know, towards the end of this portion of the lecture, there will be like concrete bullet points of what these notions mean. Okay, before doing that, a key correspondence that sort of is the key uh, to understanding a lot of the papers in this area and sort of, um, I think, a, a major confusion in how we talk about this, but shouldn't be, it's, it's, I'm, I'm here to convince you that it's not confusing, is this correspondence between subpopulations and Boolean functions, okay? Throughout, I'm going to use, to, I'm going to represent a subset, S, a subset of the universe X as a Boolean function, okay? This Boolean function is just the indicator function of set membership, okay? It's just evaluating set membership. And, and really this is a, a, a correspondence in the other direction too. If I give you a Boolean function, it defines a subpopulation. Any questions about that? Somebody want to volunteer to repeat that back to me so that we're all on the same page? Yes, thanks. Uh, you can represent a subpopulation by the indicator function of, of that set. So any, any Boolean function will induce a subpopulation where ones indicate membership in the population and vice versa, uh, any subpopulation induces a Boolean function. Great, great, exactly. And I'm going to be thinking about um, one, one thing that I don't have on the slide here, but that, uh, again, I hope is obvious, is that rather than conditioning on set membership, I can also multiply by this Boolean function, okay? So, so and we'll lose some, some, you know, factors in terms of how large this subpopulation is, but really conditioning on set membership, I want you to think about as multiplying by a Boolean function. Yes. So with this definition, you can sort of now get fuzzy definitions pretty easily. Will you be taking that approach? Or Absolutely, yeah. So, so rather than thinking about this as a Boolean function, everything that I will say throughout this entire talk could also apply to uh, bounded, bounded functions, even, even uh, with negative functions. Yes? Uh, like thinking back to the previous slide, you said like the extremes are O of 1 and O of n. Size of the collection. Is there some intuition you have of like what the middle is? Like in, log in? Um, we'll see. It, it's actually not so much about the cardinality, it's more about the complexity of the collection. Um, good. So here, here's sort of the key fuzzy definition at this point that I'm going to write down, um, but that will become concrete by the end of the lecture. So I'm going to say that a class of functions. A class of Boolean functions, a class of subpopulations, using this term interchangeably, is computationally identifiable, okay, is identifiable if it satisfies two conditions. First of all is some sort of efficient efficiency condition, computability condition, that every um, function in my class has some bounded complexity representation, okay, has small circuits, can be computed by a linear function or a small decision tree. Um, some sort of complexity bound. Um, the second condition is a little fuzzier to state right now, but it's an auditability condition. It says that given a bunch of data, um, appropriate data, I can find within uh, sort of the population if there are any um, if there are any subpopulations in my collection on which my predictions are miscalibrated. I'm going to I'm going to use that uh, auditing condition as a primitive to start, and we'll show how to make it concrete. Concrete technical. 
computational problem. Okay, so so this is really the key um, framing, um, and it leads us to a general recipe for coming up with multi-group fairness definitions. Okay. So can can you give an example where it's computable but not audible, or the other way around? So. Um, not exactly because it, it's sort of if it's uh, got a well okay let me just say that if it's computable um, here here's a trivial auditor it, suppose that your class of functions is is discrete and finite then just iterate through each collection and and run some statistical tests so so there is pretty much always a a uh, an inefficient auditor. And sort of what we're really after is sort of for an efficient auditor. And we'll define exactly what that means later on. Polynomial size circuits are polynomial size circuits are computable, but I'm like imagine that it has to be audited. Just to give one example. Because the iterating over them would take exponentially. Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see. But, but you know, if you have a concrete bound on the size of the circuit, then in principle, one could just iterate. So, okay. so, so I know the ability, or you only concern, I understand this computational concern. Yeah. Is this your only concern, or are you also concerned with this class? Like, like if we think of, for example, all singletons. Yeah. And the problem there is, I don't, it's not really computational. I mean, this yeah. it's a computable class, right? I mean, yeah, all singletons. Yes. Yeah. Perfect, but the problem there is with the ability is a statistical problem with it. Really. Exactly. So, so I'm are you, I mean, are you worried here about the statistical class or computational? Both. Okay. Statistical and computational. It needs to be feasible to audit for the, the fairness condition. Uh, yeah. When it says from data, does that mean a finite data set? Or yeah. Still, okay. yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, I can, you know, whatever you get, you get. Um, but yeah. Uh, Russell. Um, you probably mentioned you mentioned this kind of implicitly before, uh -huh. but you're going to be normalizing by the probability of getting elements from that set by multiplying by this characteristic function. Yes. So, so this issue about not having enough statistical, uh, you know, having not having enough statistics to make meaningful checks for the function is probably going to be handled by this normalization. That's right. So, so Russell's point is that um, basically the statistical aspects will be wrapped up into some sort of approximation factor. and sort of um, if your if your sets are so small that it's statistically hard to audit for them, then either you need to take your error parameters so small that you can detect them, which will require a lot of data, or you need to give up on the smallest of populations. That'll be the next definition, I presume, right? Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> We're pushing there. We'll see how, how we do on time. Okay, good. So, so really, this gives us a, a recipe for coming up with these multi-group fairness notions. We're focusing on calibration, but really, you could imagine doing it for any notion others have, um, where you fix a group fairness notion, you then come up with some identifiable collection. And then you try to enforce group fairness over every group defined by this collection of subgroups. Okay. And again, I'm I'm really leaning on this interpretation of Boolean functions as subgroups. Okay. Good. I'm going to push forward and give you some definitions now. So um, the first simplest notion that we're going to think about. Um, is called multi accuracy. Um, multi accuracy or multi accuracy in expectation is a weakened version of multi calibration, where we're only going to insist on unbiased predictions um, over each uh, over each function in our class. Okay, really, it's some sort of first order condition, if you will. Um, it what the notion says is that the Subpopulation functions should be uncorrelated with your residuals, with the errors you're making. Okay, um, so for for a collection of functions, multi accuracy says that for every function in the in the class, this uh, approximate equality holds. 
okay, that, that my predictions um, are, are accurate in expectation over the subpopulations defined by C um, with respect to Y. Averaged over C, the expectation of Y and the expectation of P tilde of X look the same. Good, so I'll show you what multi-calibration is. So, so this is sort of the simplest notion. Uh, multi-calibration takes it a step further. It requires that your predictions aren't just accurate in expectation or aren't just unbiased, but really that they're calibrated over these subpopulations, okay? Calibration, again, requires me to condition on my predicted value. It says, look at the level sets of my predictor. I want you to be uncorrelated with sort of the errors that you're making, um, even conditioned on, or uncorrelated with subpopulations, even conditioned on the level sets, even within each level set. Okay. And, uh, good. So that, that's sort of the notion, right? So this multiplying by C of X here, again, one can think about this as conditioning on membership in some subpopulation. Yes, Peter. Why do you not just include the conditioning event in the collection C? The approximate conditioning event? Um, I see. So define some, you know, pull this out and do an indicator here or something. Yeah, absolutely. You could. So, so sort of the, the uh, formal, most formal definition I'll put up on the board right now is some approximate version of multi-calibrations um, that, that there's a number of ways that you can formalize sort of exactly what it means to be approximately calibrated. Preakshit can tell you all about it. Um, and yeah, go ahead. So just to uh, figure out into this question. If you put the conditioning into C, then the family C is not based on the property. It's got to depend on the property. It's got to depend on. So, so, so the, the point is that, that conditioning on my level sets depends on my predictor, right? So, so somehow um, I can move this, this uh, P of P tilde of X into C. I can move it into functions that take both X and my current prediction. But now there's a circularity. It's it's totally fine. You can work with this. We do work with it. Um, but but um, yeah. So but, what is the quantifier on P on P star? There's no quantifier on P star. No, is it for every P star or your fifth P star in the world or what is this? Oh oh oh. So th this is the quantifier on P star is for the distribution D. So for the distribution that I'm taking this expectation over. I guess I was thinking of C as like all the things you can work with. And so P tilde would not go outside of that. But you are going to allow P tilde to be a richer class than what you give you use to C. This is that's right. That's right. So so C it C exactly um, to your point. We can think of C as a concept class, as a as a hypothesis class even. Um, but the, the, what we'll show is that to learn these multi-calibrated predictors, we're actually going to step outside of that class. Not, not by a lot, but by some. Um, very, you know, we'll give a boosting algorithm. Good, and so again, like this is a technical approximate definition. Um, we'll see that various different approximations can be used and how they come up. Um, but the way that I think you should think of it is as alpha as being some small constant, like 1%. And um, your predictor is being supported on roughly one over alpha buckets, okay? one over alpha prediction intervals. Could you, could you just remind us what the second expectation is over? Is that over the algorithms running this? No, so this expectation is, o is just over um, sort of the, the values that you would witness, the level sets. So, yeah. So alternatively, I could, so what I'm trying to get away from is saying for every B in, in this continuous interval. So, could observe. so another way you could say this is work with this definition and say that it's for every B in, that is supported by your prediction. 
has positive probability, and even you need to say non-trivial positive probability. So could you handle it by uh, putting in, instead of give conditional, also multiply by the characteristic function and say that's approximately zero for every V. Yes, exactly. That's correct. And now, so so multiplying by the indicators is uh, better than conditioning on you know uh, <laughs> these low measure events. Um, but now then you have to think about what your alpha is mm -hmm. and, and what approximation you're going to require. The point is that that sort of if you give out predictions on very small, uh, if you give out predictions with very small probability, you're not going to be able to reason about those from data. So we somehow need either your approximation factor to drop precipitously based on like how many values you're giving out, divide by the support size, or um, do some sort of that. Yes? Is it implied that the set, the Boolean function c of x equals one for all x is always included here? Because we need that for the correlate, for the like uncorrelated. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's a good idea to always throw in, say, the constant yeah. one function um, to recover at very least calibration, overall calibration. Yes. Good. So, so um, what I want to impress upon you is sort of how we were we had this situation before where we had the ability with calibrated predictions to give out some fixed prediction across the entire group um the 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 uh at least informal claim here is that if we are able to identify this group if we are able to identify a subgroup then multi-calibrated predictions cannot overlook the variation here they cannot look like this they must look at least this group needs to move up. And then subsequently, the other, you know, the complement would need to move down. Um, so, so what, what a bit more formally than this, um, we, can, we can sort of formalize this idea that, that multi calibration can't overlook um, variation. Okay, so, so this is, there's a number of different claims you could write down. I'm not going to prove this, but, but sort of to get a sense of it, suppose that there's some, um, subpopulation in our uh, in our collection that has you know non-trivial probability, let's say constant probability, and the expectation in this group, uh, the expected outcome conditioned on membership in this group is actually pretty high. Okay, or alternatively, you could say is is very low. Um, then if P tilde is C alpha multi-calibrated, then, then the squared error, at least, of your predictions conditioned on membership in this group needs to be pretty small. Okay. That's to say, if you're able to identify structure in Y given X, you're, if your class identifies any population that correlates significantly with the outcome, then you can't overlook that var variation over all such sets that, that for which that's the case. I don't mean this to be super technical, but hopefully intuitively it, it makes sense of what I'm trying to say. Does it make sense? <laughs> yeah. So does it make sense to make it somewhat stronger to require the calibration? a small number of intersections of the population. Ah, ah, so, so that would basically just amount to taking a richer class of intersections of these seeds. I know, but, uh, but they see that you want some kind of closure property, whatever group you are working with, it extends the class. Um, yeah, I, maybe. Uh, quickly, we're going to end up with very small groups. Or with uh, you know uh, sigma algebra or something. Why is the zero one variable, or is why is it a uh, probability? The last line where you have um, to y minus y p tilde. Seems like that would be oftentimes fairly large. Yeah, but but so the, it's a great question. The point is, I'm actually getting close to the label. 
not not because um, I'm assuming that this okay. expectation is very large. But yeah, exactly. This is sort of um, we could have replaced this with p star, but it's close to the true probabilities. Okay, so um, we can. I'm going to push a little bit forward. When should I stop this? Uh... Okay, so let's let's say that um, good. So hopefully I've convinced you that this is an interesting idea. Uh, we can debate exactly what it's good for or, or when it's appropriate as a concrete notion of fairness. Um, but uh, the technical outstanding question is is sort of propose that this is a good definition. It should be an effective, to be an effective definition, we need to be able to learn it to achieve multi-calibration, okay? And so next, um, what I'm gonna do is outline a learning algorithm for achieving multi-calibrated predictors. Okay? The claim will be that this algorithm is data efficient and only uses standard tools from supervised learning, uh, much in the way that uh, boosting does. Okay, so let me give uh, sort of the highest level overview of the algorithm. You can do that before our break and then we'll probably get to the technical details after. So at the highest level, we're going to reduce the problem of learning a multi-calibrated predictor to simply auditing for multi-calibration. Okay, this is sort of the, the audibility condition that uh, I mentioned earlier. But so in the auditing problem, what are we given? We're given data, uh, X, Y pairs. Okay, and we'll think about having a set of predictions. Uh, p tilde of x on, on these x's, okay? And the auditing question just simply asks, does p tilde satisfy C alpha multi-calibration? And the algorithm will be iterative and, and we'll just simply go as, first we ask the auditor, are my predictions multi-calibrated? And we start with trivial predictions. Um, likely then the auditor will say, no, you're not multi-calibrated. Here is a set on which you're miscalibrated. Yeah. The auditor witnesses you this C, okay? Then you do some update, you ask again. And again, the auditor witnesses you some C prime now on which you're miscalibrated, okay? And the, the insight here, the, the algorithmic step is to say, given a set on which I'm miscalibrated, how do I update my predictions to move towards something global? to make some sort of global progress. So that after not too many iterations, we're guaranteed that the auditor will return, yes, you are multi -colored. Good. So, um, good, I guess I have time to, to put the algorithm up on the board. So um, this is the algorithm. Uh, as you, you know, at the highest level, it's uh, quite simple. So we're just gonna initialize the predictor to any kind of predictor. Um, you know, one half is, is good. We'll do it for everyone. And then we're gonna repeat uh, a process where uh, the first, in this uh, sort of iteration, we're gonna check the multi-calibration constraints, okay? For all C, we're gonna check whether there exists some C that um, violates the condition significantly, okay? If there is, then we're gonna formulate some sort of update to our current predictions based on uh, our current predictions, based on the set that we observed, that we witnessed, and based on alpha, okay? And we're just gonna repeat that over and over again until hopefully we, we hit some point at which we terminate when all of the constraints are okay. At, at, at present, you know, it's a big hopefully. It's a, when, when should this stop? Okay. Um, good, so I, I'll probably jump forward. Um, this is the more technical version of uh, exactly what I just said, where um, we have to do some sort of um, technical rounding here to make sure that um, we can, again, this has to do with the sort of approximate notion of multi-calibration and making sure that what we're observing, we can sort of justify statistically. But what we're looking for is some C and some V on which the violation of this constraint is significant. 
um, both in terms of the density of the prediction and in terms of the violation. Okay, and here we'll set it to be alpha squared. Uh, we'll see why that. Uh, we'll see why that makes sense. Um, and then we're just going to do an additive update. Okay, the additive update is going to add in some copy of our circuit C, uh, some copy of the subpopulation that we're witnessing, as well as indicating which level set you're part of right now. Uh, I'm rushing through this because I'll, I'll, I'll do it again after the break. But um, first off, the claim is that if this algorithm, MC Boost, returns a predictor at all, then it's multi-calibrated. That much should be pretty clear from the termination condition. Um, MC boost only returns something if there does not exist a C such that uh, this condition is violated. Therefore, it, it must be multi calibrated. Here, um, this is why we sort of need to round our predictions to um, one over alpha intervals and why we take alpha squared. Because we're going to sort of say that uh, this probability. Imagine that we had alpha squared violation on one over alpha buckets, and this sums up to at most alpha. So, so that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a significant violation on one of one over alpha buckets. Okay. Um, so, and I claim that that gives you that um, violation. Um, and so then really the question then becomes when, when does this uh, algorithm actually terminate? Okay. And, and that's, uh, I, I think I'll pause there. We can go take a break and come back for, uh, to answer this punchline. Okay, did you have a question? So the fact is like, how do you find the exist of that such thing? Small because non-convex We'll talk about it. <laughs> for now, for now, I'm assuming that you have no Great. See you in half an hour. Uh, sorry, I'm more We'll start. We'll meet back here at 11 a.m. and start for the second half of the talk. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.